Solo Hunters Finding Wild podcast is presented by Global Rescue, the world's leading membership organization providing medical, security, evacuation, travel risk, and crisis management services. These are the people on the ground who have your back and who have the resources to get you out of any sticky situation should the need arise. And with Global Rescue membership starting at only 119 bucks, there's no reason to travel without it. Go to globalrescue.com slash solo hunter to find out more. And if you do decide that you need a plan, tell them that I sent you and use promo code SOLO at checkout. Big hole. Put on some frozen boots. Go tread some frozen tundra. We've got two days of solid pack. Stay on this backside until I get right on freaking top of it. We literally have 45 minutes till the plane is supposed to land. Hi, I'm Tim Burnett, and welcome to the Solo Hunter Finding Wild podcast. On today's episode, I'm headed up to Lake Tahoe to meet up with my good friend, Dave Baronio. Dave might be best known as a face of various Cabela's marketing campaigns, his hunting and personality for Outback Outdoors on the Sportsman Channel, and for his successful guiding adventures with the RK Hunting Company out of Wyoming. Dave most recently returned from an extended trip to New Zealand where he was guiding hunts and hunting for himself. He even got into a little bit of trouble while solo hunting for tar. We discussed a variety of topics, including how living a real life matters, the value of making friends with good hunters, the pros and cons of hunting with other people, why we should all put down our hunting egos, becoming a hunting mentor, how you can't outrun bad shooting, and destination hunting in New Zealand. All of these show notes and more can be found at solohunter.com. Please subscribe to the Solo Hunter newsletter to be updated on the release of new episodes and films, product sales, and promotions. And if you feel so inclined, join our Solo Nation all-access membership for exclusive archive content not available anywhere else and to view additional TV episodes and films well before they're ever released to the general public. As always, thank you for the continued support, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with the one and only Hollywood Dave Baronio. So does this sound okay? Can you hear? Yeah, me? you sound good. Sounds good. Is it loud enough in your headset? Oh yeah. Okay. Sweet. Does this? Do I sound pretty good? Yeah. And that's me. <laughs> Actually, I listened to a podcast the other day on the art of manliness, and it was all based on how to how to um, strengthen your voice. Kind of, it was a voice coach guy that does stuff for some Hollywood people and everything. And I was listening to that. I'm like, yeah, pretty much everything that he said to do, I do exactly the opposite. So, <laughs> <laughs> I listened to that podcast too. I haven't oh, heard. I haven't heard that one. Um, you know, just being away, I haven't listened to a lot of podcasts. Uh, I like his. He like um, it's Brett McKay. It's the Art of Manliness podcast. He has a lot of good guests. Some of them I'm not that into, but um, I like his format. Like he really, he just gets into it right to the point. No dinking around. Not like you know a lot of. Our hunting podcast, we want to chill and hang out, right? We want to talk about everything that's going on. And he just sits down, boom, 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 hits the questions. Here's your, here's my guest. And they just rip right through it. Yeah, he's got it lined out. Yeah. Perfect. And when we talk about hunting or the outdoors or whatever, it's just, you know, it, it just kind of flows with the wind just like it does up on the mountain. Yeah, it wouldn't work. You sit down, all right, Dave, I got a list of questions here for you. I'm just going to hammer these out. And just and I'd answer it. with yes. Yes. No. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm with Dave Baronio. And I, uh, first of all, I owe you an apology, I think, from Hunt, was it Hunt Expo or um, Sheep Show? We had had a chance to, to talk and chat and hang out for a little bit. And I feel like our conversation was abruptly ended midstream, you know? Yeah, but it was nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with being in those type of environments where, you know, you could have a conversation. Next thing you know, somebody right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, but I, I seriously, though, as, as a friend and somebody that appreciates you and and respects you like i can visually remember looking you in the eyes and we're talking and you're like let's continue this let's let's get together here in just a little bit and and let's continue this conversation yeah because it was deep and then it didn't happen (laughs) and i was like son of a gun i am a dirt bag you know and um so anyway i wanted to apologize to you for that but so we'll be able to do that after this podcast conversation (laughs) yeah there's things that being discussed that that are for no one else right that's life life matters yeah you know and and the things that make us who we are and 
and how we navigate life. And it's nice. And I do appreciate that, Tim, is you being a, a friend. We've had some very good conversations up on the mountain, on hikes, you know, in our passing. And uh, those th- those conversations are cherished every yep. every time. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to share a little bit of history or background on you and how, of how I got to know you or came to know you um, years and years and years ago before any of Solo Hunter started, before any of you your work with Outback Act Outdoors, I think, had started. And um, when my wife and I moved to Reno, and I don't know if you remember this or not, we moved to Reno for the first time 15 years ago, whenever it was. So it would have been 2002 or three. we moved to Reno. And I was just getting into the 3D scene where I, I wanted to meet some people. And so I started to go to the Silver Bowman, some of those 3D shoots. And I remember down in Urington pulling into a shoot and seeing your truck. I can't remember what truck you're driving or what decal was in the back, but I was like, whoa, that guy's, that guy's serious about hunting. Cause there must've been 15 decals or something. <laughs> Whatever. But you and I had met at that shoot. And I don't know if you remember well, that. I do remember that. And the entire day shooting, I was like, this guy is really solid. Like he's a cool guy, you know, not only because I think they were talking about a big mule deer buck that you had just killed um, as well. So I was like, wow, he's, he's, good hunter but he's also fun he's a cool guy so that's when i when i had first met you and then i don't think our paths crossed again for a long time <laughs> after kind of that different directions but yeah so i wanted to share that share that story i don't know if you remember no that i do i do remember that being out there yeah. and then later on down the line a few years a few years in passing mm-hmm. our paths connected again it's like yeah brother it's good to see you that's again right, that's right well, you want to say tell a little bit about yourself kind of for the some maybe some of the listeners that don't know much about you or I'm really, I really just am loving life and I'm living it to the fullest. Um, you know, for me being outdoors and, and the adventure of just life experiences is, is what's really important to me. And, you know, it's been a, it's been a wonderful journey for me, you know, growing up here in Tahoe and growing up, you know, my ski racing and travels and everything has been wonderful. But then after college and really, really getting deep into hunting, um, you know, and doing some, uh, just putting myself out there, not for fame or notoriety, but as a friend to different people out there, uh, the, the, you know, the paths started to cross and things started to, you know, to work into something much greater. That's when I met Trevin Stoltzfus, uh, without back outdoors. Yeah. He's become a great friend over the years. And I don't know if I ever told you the story of how this, this went, but, um, there was a, a small archery shop here in, uh, well, down over the hill in Gardnerville. Um, it was Sage Creek Outfitters, and I bought my first spot hog. Was that Gunny? Was he the owner of that? No, that okay. was that was in Carson. Okay, but gotcha. um, no, this was a guy named was Scott, and uh, I bought my first spot hog. And, you know, was and I'll get to something on the spot hog here in a second. But um, so I picked that up, and I became friends with Scott. Anyway. Through whatever lines, I think Trevin was riding for Eastman's at the time, or uh, no, he was with Best of the West mm-hmm. when they had an archery archery segment. So Trevin um, was talking to Scott and said, "Hey, I would really like to hunt Nevada. I don't know the first thing about it. What do I do?" And Scott said, "You know what? Just give this guy a call. He's a cool dude, and he's, you know, if you guys get along, it'll probably help you out and figure it out." So Scott passed Trevin my phone number. I mean, you can see how things are starting to weave their way through. Trevin calls me up, introduces himself. I don't need, I have no clue who this guy is. You know, I, I don't even watch TV. I don't watch, uh, <laughs> he didn't have a TV show at that time, did he? They were it doing was, some digital stuff, was, weren't they? Um, no, I think they, they did have some stuff on, they? on TV for the Best of the West. Oh, that's if right. If I remember yeah, yeah. right. Um, see, I forget about his involvement with Best of the West. And Was there some others after that, too, before Outback Outdoors started? Or No. No, it went from best to the west, and that's when we, that's when our paths crossed. Okay. So, so he called me up and he said, Hey, Dave, I'm really interested in hunting Nevada. I don't know the first thing about it. You know, what do I do? And just through conversations, you know, I just put myself out there and said, I tell you what, we've never met. So, you know, this could be a fun opportunity. Yeah, you're milking to, information off to, these. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, you could tell he had no, no clue about Nevada. Yeah. So I said, I said, why don't we apply? together because i have a couple points as a nevada resident i know you're going to do you're trying to do a show with you know do a tv show and um 
we'll apply together. If we draw, then I'll do the research and do the do some of the scouting, and we'll meet up and we'll go do this hunt together. Well, we ended up drawing up in uh, the East Humboldt. Mm-hmm. Uh, we packed we packed in there the first time. <laughs> the first time we're going hunting together, I meet him the night before at the hotel room. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> we packed up a bunch of the, you know, WA and Mountain House and a bunch of the uh, rest of the food, and we hooked up with this great outfitter that packed us in 13 miles. We hunted for six days, did not see a single person. Mm-hmm. We had, you know, some great opportunities. Saw, you know, hundreds of hundreds of deer, and um, you know that's where the relationship started. Uh, I wasn't looking for anything anything out of it but um that's where it grew and and through seeing how i hunted and how i could glass and everything else he he took a risk on me too probably no better way to get to know a guy than five or six days on the mountain no <laughs> you know did you, sh- you share a tent and all that kind of stuff no we didn't share a tent. <laughs> there was a big rock between <laughs> us <laughs> but there was that would be awkward and somebody that you've never met just like hey, let's go on a hunt you know yeah, you know, it, it, was, it was ballsy, but y- you kind of get a sense of people through sure. the way they talk to you, and and then you look look them up a little bit. And I know you, there's a lot of things you don't see on social media, mm. and so, you know, to really dive into something deeper and get to know somebody on, on those levels is so much so much more important. Right. It's been nice seeing some people put their, put their true self out there, their failings, and mm-hmm and everything else but you know i took a risk and uh and that started a great relationship so without back outdoors that started to grow um and then you know another path stemmed off of that and we hunted with the rnk hunting company in wyoming um one year and i met daniel richens who's one of the owners just through talking he said you know if you ever want to guide and I thought, man, guiding, I don't know if I want to do that. Being on the mountain is such an important place for me. It's where I'm closest to my creator. Why do I want to take somebody up there if he's going to be just a, a pain, right? But Because that's your first um, that's your first that's notion my, or thought of, of guiding. You know, yeah. I'm going to have to deal with clients, and all the, the clients are all going to be wieners. And <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. It's going to take <laughs> away terrible. from that experience, right? Yeah. And that was, that was just me being, right. you know, inexperienced and kind of lame in that in that uh, belief so i took him up on it and i worked for him for three weeks that you know uh, i think it was that fall and i had some of the most amazing experiences with clients yes i did have one client that was just not anybody i wanted to be on the mountain with but what was so amazing about that was even though i couldn't stand being on the mountain with him i was still calling elk i was still pulling in animals i was experiencing everything fully so i never let somebody else being out there take away from my enjoyment and what i was soaking in and that was you know kind of a revelation for me um and that's what started my my career guiding and then it was one thing after another and i started working full-time for for uh rnk hunting company in wyoming at the queen mountain lodge uh running that property for a few years and um uh you know it's just snowballed from there but it you know i think that was one of the best experiences that first Mm -hmm. that first time out there just realizing that i could enjoy this no matter who i was on but i have had hundreds of clients that have been so enjoyable to be on the mountain with and even if they're brand new to hunting or if they if they're really experienced i get to learn something from everybody yeah that's one thing that i found is um Everybody's different, and everybody does things differently. Even hunting with my brothers who, who you've, or people that you've known forever, they're going to do something that surprises you, and you're like, huh, I wonder what? And I'm always, I'm always finding myself um, thinking, why did they do that? You know, even when I've, I've spent very, very little time hunting with Remy, but when we did, I kept saying, I wanted to approach it with the aspect of, why is he doing that? You know, because you can never know everything, right? And I'm sure if you and I hunted together, I'd be it'd be the same way. I'd be like, well, why would Dave do that? You know, <laughs> not not in a in a negative way, but it'd be more like, is there something to learn here? Or uh, now, why did he go upwind <laughs> to that deer? <laughs> What's he doing? He's going up there. Oh, he's taking a piss. Dang it! <laughs> I hear I thought I was going to learn something. <laughs> I spent a lot more time the last couple of years hunting with other people, um, which is bringing back a new, a new different, a new level of love for for 
that style of hunting that I've been missing out on for a long time. You know? Hunting with somebody else yes, as opposed to yes. the solo? I still, st- still hunting solo is still my number one favorite thing to do for a lot of the reasons that you kind of mentioned. You mm-hmm. know, it's just the solitude. I, I really, truly believe that it's y- – y- people talk about shrooming or, you know, psychedelics or whatever else. And I was thinking about this the other day. That's that's my psychedelic. When I go out, it takes it takes longer for me to get to that euphoria state, to that level of high. Maybe it takes a couple of days to get to it. But I really do feel different when I'm out there hunting by myself than when I'm with someone else. And it's that's hard to explain. It, 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 it's hard to explain that that feeling that you get when you have have been in that place and done that, and and your body and your mind have been so quiet, you know, for a certain period of time in your in your thoughts. You have to get past all of the obstacles of the, oh, I'm lonely or I'm bored or. This it's hot out. It sucks. I'm hungry. What you have to get past once once you get past all of those stages, then it's there's nothing like it. When you get to that point where you're comfortable there, and I don't always hit that point. You know, sometimes it's like three days into it, it's like I'm done. I'm going home for a while. <laughs> then I'll come back. You know, when my mind is right. Type of thing, so. Well, one one thing, just you know, regressing just a little bit about hunting with other people, whether they're brand new or they're very experienced, I think it's really important for us to just put away our egos. I mean, because I've killed a lot of things. You've killed a lot of things. You know, there's other guys that are out there that are much better hunters and better shots and, you know, more fit, everything else. But if we can put down our egos and just soak in what somebody else is doing, we become so much better uh, personally. And so I, I love to go on solo hunts. I love that experience, just like, you know, what you just explained. And I'm, I'm just free. Um, you know, it starts something new in me, kind of refreshes my soul, but to be out there and experience, to see things with somebody else, with, with one other person and be able to share those memories and to be able to bounce ideas and just, you know, work together. You may not even talk, you know, while you're out there, but just being out there in the presence of somebody else and seeing things through their eyes and, you know, the way they do things, I think is, that's one of the one of the best parts about it for me. How is it for you when you, when you see, I've never, I've never really done it in a hunting situation. In other situations I've set back and like, like when I've edited a video together and I want to show it to say my wife or some friends or something, instead of me watching the video with them, I'm watching them like to see their reaction to it, to see if what, cause there's certain parts that I'm like, yeah, this is going to impact in this way. So I'm watching them. Do you ever find that in hunting when you sit back and you're watching a client or watching somebody you're with and just absorb their inner, their reactions? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's what's so fun about it is, you know, I, I might get, you know, a couple tags a year and it's great for me to go hunt, but to take somebody out there, I, I would much rather take somebody else out and give them that experience, you know, to call in a, a bull or to, to, help a guy stalk in on a, on a mule deer, um, into range. And just to see what is, you know, what's going on in their eyes, what's going on in their, you know, hear their breathing, hear their heart, (laughs) hear their heartbeat, you know, when you're standing right next to them, that's, I get so much excitement out of that to see what they're, how they're taking it in. Um, there've been, you know, people that are just like, eh, I'll shoot that one. Boom. They're not as into it. Not as, not as into it. And so, you know, I question, what is it about hunting that, you know, that gives something to you that you, you get out of it. Um, you know, and everybody's different. So you have, you have, you'll obviously have clients that are into it for a certain reason. You know, they're, they're going on this hunt. Um, how, how often is it that you have someone that's just on that hunt and all they want to do is pull the trigger and then be done and load the truck and get home versus how many people are like, I don't care if it takes us all 10 days or, you know, whatever, or if they tag out on the first two or three days, they're sticking in camp for another week or however, like what's, what's kind of the breakdown of that? Yeah, it's, it's funny. There are a few guys every year, um, that, that will guide, uh, they might not be so much my clients, but you know, if we're running five to 10 guides up in, up in Wyoming, we see all different, all different avenues, uh, in regards to what guys are doing. Some guys will come in and, you know, it's almost like they don't un- unpack the truck. <laughs> you know, they want to shoot the first thing. And it's, it's funny because I'm like, you, you spent this money and you have the next five days to enjoy being completely away from 
society. The news isn't on. You get to have great food. You get to hike around. You can go fish. You can go help other Mm -hmm. clients and guides. Why wouldn't you want to experience that? But they're just like, sweet, I got a nice buck. I'm out of here. And yeah, I've got, I've got that trophy. I've got that picture, you know, and then, you know, for the most part, I'd say seven, most of the people that go there just want to absorb everything. They yeah. want to take everything in. Because, you know, in our busy lives and everything going on, there's only certain ways we can really get back and recharge. And, you know, for me, that that would be a way. And for some of these guys, that's that's their that's their way to get away. I would say that first case scenario is kind of, I don't know, is, is crazy, you know. But I've been there. Like I, when you're, when you've got these hunts stacked back to back and also you're thinking, you know, producing for the show or whatever, and, and I'll go into a, a hunt and I, I did that a few years ago. I go into this hunt and I killed a nice bull elk, like on the first day and I'm thinking, sweet, pack it up on the road, driving to the next hunt. I'm like, man, I only spent two days total, one day driving a day, killing and packing. And then now I'm driving back. Like that is lame. I know, know it's it's crazy, but for for you it is a lifestyle. You know, it's it is part of what you do for a living. You do have a passion, and when you're out there, even if it's for the day, you've soak you're soaking mm-hmm. everything up. The guys that we're getting, this might be the only hunt they do all year. And for some guys, they've saved you know a few years to be able to come out there um, to do a to those do are, a hunt. With those us. are probably the guys that focus more on the vacation aspect of it and just the whole the whole package more so than just I'm gonna I'm gonna load the truck and then I'm off to the next state or the next hunt or whatever. Yeah. And not to say that yours is a production, but you you're on a mission. You do this hunt, you kill on the first day. You could kill on the fifth day, who who knows? But you you don't miss that opportunity and then it's okay, now we gotta shift gears and refocus and yeah. boom. But you're not you're not missing out on that that experience that really makes you who you are. I have, I have missed out. That's what I'm saying is, is I can kind of, I can kind of relate to the, of that, how, <laughs> what I think that is because I have, I've, I've, from my own doing, I've missed out on that. And the last few years, you know, especially when I go home and to hunt elk or something or, or to hunt deer with my buddies in, in Southern Idaho, like I've been a lot better at enjoying everything outside of the hunt, you know, cause some of those, not every hunt is a back country backpack in by yourself kind of thing. A lot of times it's, I'm hunting the mornings by myself. Then I'm going back and meet my buddy at the gas station. We're having a burger. And then, you know, then I'm back out after it. And then after that, instead of sleeping in my trailer in 30 below weather, I'm in his bonus room, you know, <laughs> yeah. and having a hot shower and a hot meal, you know, that his wife cooked for us and hanging out with his kids. Like that's how a lot of hunts go down too, you know, but you don't see that whole part of it. But there's been cases where like I've, I've missed that opportunity because I'll roll in, I'll kill it, and then I'm gone. You know, um, <laughs> it, yeah. it's funny looking looking many years ago. Um, you know, when I when I was married, uh, in the very beginning, uh, one of the questions when I went on one of my first hunts, there were two of us going. We both had tags, and I filled on the first day. <laughs> and I remember my wife at the time said, "So now what?" I said, "Well." <laughs> My buddy still has a tag. I'm not going to leave him out. <laughs> I'm not going to leave him out here. We're both going to, you know, even though I kill him, that doesn't mean I'm I'm coming back. <laughs> so I, I have a dirty trick, and I can tell it because my wife doesn't listen to or watch anything that I do, right? So um, if I do tag out on the first or second, because I've learned from experience, because if I, if I kill, she's like, when are you coming home? Well, I got to hurry up and get home, right? Um, but I'm just like... Wait a wait a day or two. Wait till I wait till I'm ready to come home before I say, yeah, I got it. I got my buck. You know. <laughs> yeah, don't post anything on the first day. <laughs> not lying to her. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just withholding information, which is probably worse than lying. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> yeah, don't post anything on the first day. And uh, oh yeah, I never post anything till months later. Anyway, who knows? But, no, but you got. I think the the key is there is you've got to figure out your situation. You know, for the for the clients that you have. They're each coming into that hunt with their situation, you know, and they're, they have their own goals in mind and everything else. Your job as the guide is to make sure that they have the best damn time that they've ever had, uh, the most opportunities they've ever had. And you probably work harder for those um, crappy clients than you ever would for the good clients because you want to get them filled and, and <laughs> well, you back know, in the lodge, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there are those. But you know what? I'm in a, I'm in a very unique pos- position in, in my careers. You know, I have the wedding business here in Lake Tahoe and I do, you know, 
couple, I do a hundred and something weddings a year in and around being gone hunting for six months. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. So I've got, uh, there's a little bit of a balance there and then I'm out and I'm guiding. So what's, r- what I take really, what's really personal to me is the fact that I have the opportunity and the, viv- uh, and the, and the resources to make a difference in people's lives. When I'm performing weddings, I like to be able to customize each wedding to each couple and you know, the words that I express and, and the way I present it, it's done with conviction and belief for, for the words that I'm sharing. And, you know, people just, it, sometimes it blows them away. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've, you know, influenced their life. I've given them a memory. They will, they'll have the rest of their lives. Not only am I in those wedding pictures, uh, hoping they stay together. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Looking at the divorce rate these days, but, um, you know, they, that I've made an impact there and they'll remember me. Same with guiding. I take it very personal. And so even if I have a crappy client, I have the opportunity to make a difference in that person. And I've actually changed, you know, attitudes and changed, uh, you know, their beliefs on things, mm-hmm. um, to, to create something really nice. So even if, even if it is a, one of those clients, a lot of times by the end of the week, they're like, well, you know, that was, that was so much more than I ever expected. And, you know, it's, it's my, it's not just a job, but it's a, it's a passion of mine to create that adventure and that experience and, and make sure that they are completely taken care of because I'm passing on knowledge and, and an experience to somebody that, uh, yeah, one, they've paid money for, but two, that they, they deserve to go away with that and have that you know, have that as a memory the rest of their lives. Yeah. I think, I think deserve is a good word for that. You know, I, I don't, you never know. It, it's weird. My brother and I just had this conversation, kind of a text conversation over the weekend. And you never know when or how you're going to impact somebody's life or somebody or how many somebody's in indirectly or whatever else. And that's why you know, doing what you do. Do you sit back and do you think about the couple and think about and write something specific for them or something a that lot would of times, impact them? Yeah, a lot of times I will. Tahoe is such a destination location. So people are coming from, you know, all around to get married up here. And, and my weddings will be at, you know, say Edgewood Golf Course and then at the top of Heavenly and then the Ridge and then up at the Ritz-Carlton. So, you know, there might be multiple ones through the day. But what's, what's really neat is every couple, uh, assuming they want to put that effort into it. Some people go, I'll just give us a basic ceremony and let us get married. But then there's a lot of couples that really want to, uh, that, that allow me to make it personal. So I get on the phone with them. I learn their backstory, how they met, what they love to do together, the things that drive them, you know, the kind of what balances them out and why this person that's standing before them making those promises is the one they want to be with the rest of their lives. Cause that's, you know, it's ser- it's significant. And so, so I try to incorporate things that will reflect their relationship and, you know, who they are as people. I've got a lot of different things, different readings that I can put in. What I enjoy doing is kind of that impromptu stuff where I'll kind of soak in some of the things going on during the ceremony. And I might even, you know, get off of the path that I was going because I, I'm seeing things going on with them. I'm seeing things going on with the crowd. Um, it's not just reading a book, but it's, it's presenting something to them that, that they're going to, you know, that's going to be impactful. So I'll change things. And a lot of times I encourage them to write their own vows. You know, some people want traditional, you know, the better for worse, richer or poor, but when they can express their love, um, you know, and, and affection for each other from their hearts and their minds in front of their friends and family, that's what makes it personal. That's what makes it extremely special. And those are the ones that, that I love and that I, re, that I remember, because I can walk away with that going that, that couple got everything that they, they deserved in that, in that wedding day, just like being on the mountain. I stay fit all year. I work out hard so that I'm my best person up on the mountain, but also my clients deserve to have a guy that could even pack them out. Right. Even if I have to quarter them up. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which you hope you never which have I, to do. yeah uh yeah i brought him back but he's quartered <laughs> up <laughs> i gotta go back for the front shoulders yeah. um so a lot of things that i do throughout the year set me up to give them the best of me yeah that's a good attitude to have that's a good attitude to have. 
This podcast episode is also brought to you by Prime Archery. Prime bows have some of the most advanced technologies and are backed by the most advanced warranty in the business. Check out the new line of Synergy Logic bows with axle to axle lengths from 31 to 39 inches, parallel cams that virtually eliminate cam lean, Synergy grip technology that provides unparalleled balance in hand, the Flexus AR roller guard to reduce side load and riser torque while shooting, and much, much more. Prime bows will make you a better shot. Also brought to you by G5 Outdoors and the G5 lineup of broadheads from the all-steel fixed blade Montec and my favorite Striker V2 replaceable fixed blade to T-Bone's favorite Dead Meat and Waddell's favorite Havoc expandable broadheads. 100% steel, 100% tough, and now with the new BMPs or ballistic match points, tuning your bow to broadheads just got that much easier. G5 Outdoors is an American-made company. G5 products are designed to hunt. Now that we've uh, we've had every single male listener tune out because we started talking about weddings and vows <laughs> and all that kind of thing, we'll bring it back to hunting so that we can hopefully get those guys back in, right? Yeah, well, you know, if there's those guys out there that, that uh, you know, at least they know what I do there, and if they find somebody, we'll make something. <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's fascinating because, um, you know, I, I have certain beliefs, and I, and I really do believe that it's it's – it's way bigger than I could ever be, you know, by myself. I think you really do have to look at life as how am I impacting someone's life, you know. And as a father, you're looking at it as your children. How am I impacting my children's life? As a friend or, a, a, you know, um, a guide, you're looking at how am I impacting this person's life. And and I take that stuff seriously as well. Um, so let's get back to what I wanted to do was go over some of the questions that some people posed on here, the appropriate questions. Um, and kind of, kind of tie it into a little bit there. So we were probably going to get questions from guys that know you maybe. Um, we'll just start here. We'll start on Facebook. This is from a guy named Troy Franks. Good old Dave. Do you know Troy? Troy, buddy. What are you doing? <laughs> so this is going to be a loaded question cause you know him, right? <laughs> How about the best way to get the younger generation into hunting with everyone's busy lives? <sighs> Put yourself out there and find those kids that may not have a father uh, figure in their life that, um, you know, that, that could take them out, um, you know, just through friends and family, uh, not being creepy or anything else, but, you know, just keep, keep the awareness that there are kids out there um, that deserve, you know, that opportunity uh, to be able to maybe go through the hunter safety course or to, you know, learn fishing or, or hunting. But there's a lot of, a lot of young kids out there, both boys and girls that don't have that father figure, um, in their life. And, uh, I think it's just putting yourself out there and, you know, through your experience, you know, hunting and fishing, having something to give back to them, um, is, a, is a great gift. Uh, I don't know if there's any right way. Cause there's, you know, maybe a, a boys and girls club that you can find out a little bit more, maybe through, you know, a church, something like that, where you can kind of do a little research and keep your. Yeah. I don't know what the best, an- I get asked that often. I don't know what the best answer is outside of really, you've got to have a mentor, you know, for, for a youth to get into it, they really need a mentor or a program like the, the, I think the hunter's education program is great for that, but unless somebody's there to help, help you along the way i i don't see a younger person getting into it until they're later until they're old enough to make those decisions and and um a, aggressive enough to put forth the effort to find out on their own you know yeah um, uh, but but also with that it's not just so much the kids there's a lot of single parents out there there's you know single mothers out there that are raising this child that maybe they need to experience that as well so that they can promote maybe a little bit more of a lifestyle for their kids um so getting you know some of the older people that haven't done it exposed as hunters uh, you know and outdoorsmen we have a a great platform to do things right um and to to set a good example as you know out as hunters well there, i think there's there's so much about it you know there's there's the hunting aspect of it right but that goes a lot deeper there's the conservation there's reasons why we're hunting um the places that you go um the people that you're with there's so much 
there's so much deeper that you can go, even if you look at species specific, you know, of reasons why a person could generate such a, a level of passion within hunting. You know, mm-hmm. um, so it's not just about a recreation or, uh, and I hate when they call it a sport, even though technically it's a sport. Um, you know, there's reasons reasons to go about doing it. Yeah, and and each young person coming into it has to figure out their own reasons, and those reasons will, will evolve over time. I know mine have. You know, from from the time when you're just hoping to see an antlered buck, you know, and put it on the ground, and then the, to the point to where you're you're more more in a management mentality on a whitetail property or something like that. You know, yeah. it just all changes to the point to where it's like, well, now I want to make this stuff taste good. You know, instead of just killing a grill and I want it to taste good. Yeah. So, there's a whole evolution. That's, why you're, that's when you buy Remy's cookbook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but, right. but, but the volunteer thing is really important. I mean, the Department of Wildlife, they can use those volunteers. And for, uh, you know, the Pittman-Robertson Act, you know, any – any time that is volunteered by a citizen um, can be translated towards funds, tax dollars that the department can can get on the back end um, through, you know, to do uh, research and to put on the ground. But what's really neat is to go, like this past, uh, you know, spring, I helped on two antelope captures up out of Elko. We caught 50-something antelope, and they got transported to different areas. And then I also did two bighorn sheep captures um, and transported, you know, those sheep got transported to, one, a brand-new range that didn't even have, in the bloody runs, didn't have sheep in it, you know, to begin with. And so it started a brand-new, you know, herd of sheep. But there were a couple people out there that were non-hunters. They came out to experience it and to see what you know, what was going on. And there's, there's one guy, I won't mention any, any names, but mm-hmm. now he goes all the time to help. He's not a hunter. He's never killed anything, but he just loves to see how sportsmen are putting their boots on the ground, how they're getting dirty and sweaty and spending the day out there to, you know, to help these animals in conservation. There's people out there that are helping, that helped with the sheep hunt that will never get to hunt sheep in the bloody runs. And it might mm-hmm. be 20 years till those sheep get, get hunted. But we did our part to put animals on the mountain for another generation to see. They may not ever get hunted, but, you know, it's just. How cool would that be to get that population to, to a huntable population and for you to draw that tag? What a great Wouldn't story. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. Okay, so, so here's something. A number of years ago, I mean, you know that I help with some of the bear research um, right. with, the depart- with the Department of Wildlife. What that means is, is crawling headfirst into a bear den with a sow and cubs. That's what that means. Yeah. I think, I think the biologist found somebody dumb enough to, <laughs> <laughs> why don't you go in there first? No, but, but all the times that I've, you know, dug snow out of the way and gone headfirst into a bear den, um, you know, and, and helping tranquilize the mom or to do snaring projects or anything else i've i've held a lot of cubs and you know seen some amazing research and that data that has been put together over the last 20 years allowed us um or allowed nevada to have enough um you know infor- scientific data and information to propose a bear hunt for the management of animals because as we know hunting is the best management tool mm-hmm. so uh, you know, with that research, they had the information. They had something to stand on. They started the bear hunt. I don't know what is it, seven years ago now. Nine, like I think. Nine. Yeah. Um, this year, I drew a bear tag. Really? Oh, that's right. That's right. So I drew a bear tag, but I have a lot of content and and footage from climbing in. I know Trevin Stoltz this might be listening to this, and he still gives me crap <laughs> to this day because I climbed in to a log. It was a cedar log that was. Pr- I had to climb in like ten feet on my belly. You know. Yeah. scrunched up like a worm to get to this sow and that dslr was covered in red <laughs> dust and everything else you know gopros were messed up but so i have that content and now it's come it's coming to fruition that i actually have the tag i'll be guiding most of the season but i'll be able to right. hunt in november at the very end and if i do kill if i do kill a good bear or if i do kill a bear mm-hmm. then i've got a story of, right. of what this you know from the very beginning to uh that's really cool to the end because you were doing that stuff before the bear hunt before the bear hunt. way before that yeah that is neat that and it was just neat. a matter of drawing the, drawing the tag yeah. kind of wish that i didn't have you know three months of guiding that's gonna <laughs> it's gonna like, can i draw it the, next year yeah can i draw it next year but i'm gonna take that i'm gonna take that chance and tell that tell that story because it's it's it is very it's significant yeah 
you know, I want to see how you guys are doing. I want to see how. Yeah, I know you down. do. I see. I see what you. And we've talked about that before. You follow these people and you see what they're doing, and and you learn from them. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I don't watch. I don't watch TV. If I'm going to have that time, I'm going <laughs> to go for a run, or if yeah, I'm going to go yeah. for go for a hike or do other things that are. Yeah. So we'll have to circle back after your hunt. And talk about that and tell the rest of the story. You know, and, and that's the thing is I don't listen to, I don't listen to hunting podcasts. Um, I should get into following more of those that I do, but being in a, a interesting time in my life over the last couple of years, I've looked more towards, um, you know, the art of manliness and, and some of these other ones that help me become a stronger person you know inspirational that have nothing to do with hunting um that have to do with nutrition uh you know i don't want to say self-help because that's you know that's not the right word for it but you know things that help me learn about myself and question myself so as as things have gotten better i need to explore more of i mean i listen to you know hunt harvest health uh with lampers and and hillary just because i there's some things in there in regards to the nutrition and health that i take away more than um, where pe- where people are going hunting and what they're doing. Yeah. I don't listen to theirs very often, Ryan and Hillary, because it makes me feel guilty because I'm like, I'm a fat slob. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just kidding. They are amazing yeah. people. Yeah, great, great. In fact, Ryan drew a deer tag here in Nevada. Yeah. I, I reached out to him last week. I'm like, oh, I didn't get my tag. Do you mind if I tag along with you for a couple of days? You know, he's like, oh, that'd be great. Have so. you spent much time with him? A little bit. Ne- never in, in a passing. hunting situation. Just in passing. Um and uh, a lot of different events that we've we've crossed paths. Spent the night with him and Hillary at uh, a hunt expo, just talking and just uh, hanging out. So a little bit. He's a, he's a good dude. Yeah. He's good no, dude, they're but. they're an amazing family, and he's uh, he's definitely a killer. I mean, yeah, he's, oh he's he's a fascinating man to listen to. You know, very quiet. You know, he's he's soft spoken. Yeah. Um, just a just a solid solid individual definitely a killer i learned i learned a lot from that (laughs) i learned a lot from him yeah so i'm gonna try to backpack in with him um as soon as i told him as soon as he gets his point of entry figured out and his dates let me know because i have a hunt later on that week but i want to try to go up and hike in at least for a couple of days and help him glass he's gonna go up a couple days before season yeah he's find a buck and we talked about you know hunting nevada because we met at the train to hunt competition you know a number of years ago and that's where our friendship started developing and uh, then we started talking about Nevada, and and then he was drawing these tags, and you know he drew he drew one tag that's not really known for you know a lot of a lot of deer, and he he Killed finds him, he goes in there, and he kills it. <laughs> you know he he just he knows he knows what he's doing. Uh, I know, I know, it's crazy. I do I do not have that gift. I do not have that gift. Yeah. So you're you I think it's going to be great for both of you to spend time up on the mountain together. I think that'd be really cool. I would love to do that with. And a I want to be a fly people. on the wall. <laughs> I would like to spend time on the mountain with you. You know, there's a lot of people that I would would love to just spend just a couple of days. You know, just because, um, just to see it differently. You know, just to just to not be involved with the hunt at all, but to just go, um, just to see things differently. Because when you're hunting for yourself for so long, and maybe as a guide you really don't get that, but I feel like for hunting for myself so long. It, I don't. I don't know. I don't know that I've learned all that I need to learn, you know, or seen all that I need to see, or t- can can do it in the most effective way. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a check and balance system. Maybe it's a way of just saying, "Am I really doing this right?" You know. I mean, I I can kill a elk or a deer, but I want to kill a big one, you know, or whatever else. So maybe maybe I'm just doing it wrong sometimes. So. And that's what I found out about myself is every time I'm in the field, I'm searching to learn something new, and the beautiful thing about guiding in my experiences over, over the last 10 years of doing that is um uh, i learned something i learned something every i come home with something new every time i'm out there yeah i think that'd be fascinating all the different people and it's made me a better hunter for myself because guiding so many people um i you know i don't get the i don't get nervous i'm i'm sneaking in on deer going i wouldn't be moving in this fast if it were mine but man, it's working, you know? <laughs> so I, I look at it totally different. It's not my tag, but yeah. I'm going to get them in. We're going to push the envelope here. Yeah. And I've, I've pushed myself and I've learned to be a better hunter for my own experiences through. 
I think it would be others. invaluable, invaluable for someone to experience that, to hunt with a lot of other people. And that's one thing. Again, I say that I'm missing out. I'm, there's not a lot of things that I'm missing out on. I'm, I'm doing 10 times more things than I ever dreamed that I would ever be able to do, right? But I still look at things, situations like that and think, man, I would like to be able to do more of that. And so about a month ago, I went down with my son to California on a turkey hunt. We, well, it's a hog hunt that turned into a turkey hunt. <laughs> How can you not when the turkeys are all over? And I took it, what I, my approach to that was at the time was I just wanted to be the cameraman because we were there with, um, Charles Whitwam who guides for guides on this place. Um, and I just wanted to be the camera. I wanted to stand back, watch Hudson hunt with him, learn from that, learn from Charles and see, see how they're, how it's done, you know, from someone else. And it was great. It was a great experience and everything, but coming back and looking back and combing through all the footage and then look, and then having retrospect back onto how I felt the hunt went, like, I feel like I missed out tremendously because I wanted to be in Charles's position. You know, this is my son. I wanted to be guiding, but I didn't want to take, like, I, I thought at the time that that's how I needed, how it needed to be done. But now I'm looking at it saying, I screwed up. I, sh- I wanted to be in this position so that I could be right there with Hudson and to feel him shake, you know, and to be the one kind of directing him. So I, th- I think there's pros to both of it, but now we're going back next week and, uh, we're bringing a buddy of mine, Scott Redlinger, and his, he's bringing his son down. And I'm thinking, yeah, Charles, you go with Scott. I'm going to take Hudson out. <laughs> I'm going to go do, do this. So hopefully I'll get, hopefully I'll be able to finish that out, you know, and get both sides of it a little bit. So. Yeah. And with, with your own son, you know, you found out a little bit with um, Hunter, haven't you? My daughter. T- taking her Hunter, out a little bit. Uh, she hasn't drawn a tag yet. Both kids have, they've been, you know, dry on the, on the draw the last few mm-hmm. years. You know, Gatlin, his very first hunt was in the, in the, um, uh, up north of Winnemucca. The Independence? Or no, North Winnemucca. Okay. North of Winnemucca in 051. Yeah. And he shoots this buck. I'm up there with, with Keegan and Jimmy Kohler. He shoots this this buck. You know, he acquired it in the scope himself. I'm just sitting back. He did everything that he was supposed to do as a as a you know twelve year old kid. Mm-hmm. He shoots this buck. We go down and take pictures. We come. I'm packing the deer with Jimmy back up to this little skid road, and Gatlin and um, and his mom and Hunter are driving down in the Ranger. Gatlin's driving, and <laughs> he. Which he's great at, yeah. you know, everything yeah. was fun. I t- trusted him fully. Well, the front tire caught a sagebrush on the, on the bank on the right side and it tipped over in slow motion. He put his foot out. Oh no. The roll bar came down and broke both bones in his lower leg. So he is pinned under the ranger and I'm down off the mountain and all oh, I hear is man. screaming, uh, you know, from, from my daughter, um, and 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 Gatlin's, Dave, get up here! So I sp- I drop the deer and I sprint up. I think I levitated. You can't get there fast <laughs> Jim, enough. No, man. you can't. Jimmy's like, oh my god, I couldn't oh, even keep up. Man. You know, just one of those those feats of strength that come out of being scared. And I get up there, and you know, the two girls are fine, and and, and Gatlin's pinned underneath. And I'm thinking, I'm just hoping it's bruised. And when I lifted like that crazy strength, yeah, yeah, just lifting the ranger up, and it's on its side. Pulling the pulling the kid out and watching his leg just oh. fall over, so he had the greatest experience killing a deer and the worst experience because he broke his leg. But as we're getting him off the mountain, and it's dark now, it's oh. there's snow on the ground, it's dark. We still have three hours to get to Winnemucca, and what he says is because he eats deer meat every morning. You know that's his that's what he loves to ha- loves to have when when they're with me, and uh, he said, Dad, you. You did get my deer, right? Oh, you did get man. my deer, right? That was more important to him than the pain he was going through. Oh, gosh. I can't imagine. That's crazy. Yeah. Huh. Crazy you, first you, hunting story. You like to think that nothing bad's ever going to happen like that, right? But we, we were blessed. It wasn't, you know, the bar didn't come across his chest Femur or his rib or his head or, you know, yeah. anything else. So. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's crazy. <sighs> now, now it makes me just all, the only thing I can think about is, is, Making sure that nothing ever happens to my kids. As I'm out there cruising around on the four wheeler yesterday <laughs> with them on the back. <laughs> like, hey, ah. yeah. hey, you guys just pile in there. Just sit, sit low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. So, um, I can't even remember where we were at there. So let's pull up another question here. 
or comment or see what see what it is. Do you know? Oh, this guy just says, "Dude, you're an inspiration. Keep killing it in the gym and the great outdoors." I don't That's know if he's awesome. talking Who's to me or he's talking to you because it's got a picture of me above it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's. I think he said, "Yeah, you need to keep killing it in the gym." <laughs> You look uh, good, though, brother. Yeah. You look good. Yeah. Um, we won't. Well, if that, we won't that, if that was that. for me, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. It's, it you know, that's one you. thing. It's just, uh, it's, it. you know, I don't think I'm any better than anybody else, but I like to be an inspiration to people. I think that, you know, when I post stuff on, on social media, I want that stuff to be meaningful and maybe make an impact. Even if it's to one person and they see that mm-hmm. and they, you know, they know. I mean, I look at the train to hunt this year, how that went, you know, I trained, I trained so I trained so hard and I shot and my bow was fully dialed in, but I started dealing with this target panic a few weeks before the competition. Mm. I crushed it in the, in the physical aspect. I felt great, but I could not outrun bad shooting. And in, mm. in all the trained hunts I've been on, I've podiumed and I got my ass kicked. Interesting. It was it was awesome because the guys that beat me, I've been competing against for a number of years, yeah, yeah. and it was so neat to see, uh, you know, how happy they were, and they they had been like gunning for me. I mean, I'm not I was say, I'm not anything they, special, but maybe they just outworked you, Dave. Yeah, they they definitely outshot <laughs> me. Yeah, they they did they did outwork me in. I mean, they they were great shooters, mm-hmm. and they, you know, they did the, the fitness aspect, but it was really neat to to get my ass kicked because we're all human. We just do the best we can as individuals. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of ego on the line, you know, but I like to put myself out there, even if I'm going to get beat because it's going to make me a better, better individual. The next time I go out, the training is still great. The, you know, I still feel fit. My shooting's getting better, but I've had to back off a little bit because you still have target panic. I do. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get that come from. I have no idea. This podcast is also brought to you by Onyx Hunt, creators of the most comprehensive digital mapping system for hunters. Download the Hunt app from the iTunes or Google Play Store and use promo code SOLO for your 20% discount at checkout. Also brought to you by BlackOvis.com. Search the word Solo Hunter to see all the great Solo Hunter branded gear that they carry. Link to my recommended product guide and gear list. Order yourself a custom built arrow setup from their custom shop or just browse the website for all the latest gear. How old, how old are you? I'm 44. Coming with your prostate problem. That's what it is. Yeah, dude. I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm 25. <laughs> I'm, I turned 44 in a couple weeks. You do? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So. Well, ha- happy early birthday. But yeah, you know, right? you know what? No matter no matter how much we do, um, we are human, and we are, we'll all experience something that puts us back. Whether it's you know some body aching, or I mean, for for me to start having some shooting issues and i shoot a lot and you know i kill things but i miss things and and to be able to i mean everything on the everything on the course i killed you know but i was outside the difference of 10 and 12 right yeah Yeah. and it was it was crazy but it was but it was fun i'm standing down there you know in the audience and i'm watching these three guys stand up there i'm like good job guys that is so badass yeah i have never um until a couple of years ago i had never had any phys- anything physical that would have limited that I would have what I, that I would call a limitation you know until a few years ago um I had some neck issues going on and I remember at total archery I couldn't even draw my bow back I, I dropped it down to like 60 pounds or something I still could barely get get my bow back and that's only a couple weeks before season right so I just felt debilitated and I still went on these archery hunts and I still miraculously was able to kill something but um just having that in the back of your mind where it's like, if I get in this situation, I don't know if I can even even pull your bow back, let alone, you know, I've never had target panic, but that's got to be something to deal with too, where you're just not exactly 100% confident in yourself, right? It's, it's a, yeah, it's a strange feeling. Like I'll, I'll be jumping at it or I'll punch the trigger or hmm. I'm, I'm still trying to figure, figure that you, out. Uh, um, who was it? Stop shooting 90 pound bow. <laughs> I, did, I did. I did. The, uh, um, I was talking, I was talking to my friend Lane Walters back in, uh, Colorado and he learned something. Um, I don't know if he was talking 
talking to Levi Morgan or just through some podcast or something, but what Levi, and I'm assuming it was him, he would draw his bow back, he would anchor, he would hold it for a long time, and then he'd just let down. And for probably a month, he never shot a single arrow out of his bow. Or, you know, I'm just wow. making an example. I don't yeah, know how sure. long it was or if, if I'm actually right on that, but he would draw back, anchor, you know, put his pin on there, and then he'd let down. And he just did that over and over. Never fired a shot. Hmm. And uh, that helped him get over it. So that's something that that I've I've been doing. But I went down to New Zealand for two months. I didn't bring my bow. I just brought my rifle. And so I, you know, I didn't shoot uh, for for a little over two months. That, that that was another. So it would be fascinating to talk to somebody, a, a shooting coach or somebody. In fact, I'll be doing a podcast next week with um, Steve Walters down at Spot Archery. And I'll ask him about target panic and how he deals. Because I think he does some coaching and stuff, too. So I might have to go down and I'll see him. I'll ask him about that. You know, Because it, it'd be interesting to know. I've never dealt with target panic or what I what maybe would be classified as target panic. I've dealt with quick trigger, you know, where you pull back and speed shooting. But um, So I'll ask him that. I'll ask him that. So that leads us to another question that was on there was about New Zealand. So one of my – and this is, a, this is a fun story. One of my – has now become a, a good friend. Jim Massey um, is is one of our clients up in that comes to hunt with us at R and K Hunting Company in Wyoming. Well, he was going down to New Zealand and he he didn't have anybody to go with and asked if I wanted to tag along. So I went down with him as a as a guest. He says, "Yeah, come down and uh, you know we'll get you a tar." And nice. next thing you know, I've I've shot you know a stag, a tar, and a chamois. <laughs> You know, hunting down there. But I loved how Fraser Shafari's, um, Lindsey Fraser, ran his ran his operation. You know, it's a beautiful lodge. There's gourmet cooking. You know, people are they're really taken care of. Just, you know, it's like a mirror uh, to what I do up in Wyoming with, with R&K. Just, you know, on the opposite side of the world. And, you know, the clients come in. It's, you know, it's a very same flow to to the operation. But when I was down there with, with Lindsay and I was hunting, I was archery hunting down there. And, um, he saw that I could kind of figure out what I was doing. On the knew mountain. your way around the mountain. I knew my way around the mountain. And he said, yeah, if you want to give it a try and, you know, come, come down and, and hunt down here, take some clients out, that would be, that'd be pretty cool. So we set it up and, and I spent a month and a half down, down there. Um, you know, we have some of the most amazing tar hunting oh, and, yeah. you know, down on, down on those those properties so you're the south island south island south. south of christ church out of a little town called geraldine mm-hmm. that's the woodbury lodge and we have about an hour to drive from there to to the uh station that we get, that we go hunt gotcha yeah it's such an amazing so, experience what a great country i mean you've talked to remy you've been down there yeah, i watched you and remy time. you know and and your adventure down there there's something there's it's so magical to me it felt it felt like home like it felt a lot like where i grew up where when we got out of town we were near an air, a town called twizel i yeah. don't know if, where mm-hmm. that's at in relationship to a few hours out of christ church i think is what it was um but it just felt just slow you know just low paced even when we when we got done with the hunt and went into town to get some food we're like, is anything open? You know, <laughs> it's, like, so, so it's so kicked time. back, and yeah. it's like you're going back in time, you know. Oh, and the main highway that goes from you know east coast to west coast is a two lane ro- <laughs> two lane oh. road, and it was great farm country and everything. And uh, I don't even I don't even know what the total population of both the North and the South Island is, but I think it's not very much. We, but it just felt it just felt like a good pace. Sa- same as when I go home to Central Idaho. You know, there's just nothing going on, which is a good thing, and you just left to kind of the ranch life. It's you're you're awake when the sun's up and you're asleep when the sun's down. And yeah, you get and it's your work a, done. it's such beautiful, beautiful yeah. country. And you know, it, New Zealand has something to offer for every type of hunter. You know, you have the tar and the chamois and the stag and the fallow, uh, the pigs. Um, there are wapiti down there. You know mm-hmm. what we know as our elk. And if you go down there as a solo hunter, putting something together, there's so many resources and there's some great public lands you don't have to buy tags you know you have to you know sign up something with the department uh, of conservation the dock Uh uh, department 
but there's there's so many resources to be able to go and and hunt where you would like to go as long as you're on the public property right. or for some people that don't want to do the research and put a week into maybe getting a shot on a tar for that experience as a solo hunter there's there's some great operations down there and that's what we see you know with Fraser Safaris we put them through the ringer when it comes to when it comes to some of these hunts you know they're they're not just gimme hunts they're hard hard tar hunts and the, the stags can be pricks down there as well right. and, but um you know there's a there's a there's so many different uh varieties of people that are trying to experience something different yeah i think until until i experienced it i didn't really until because remy was guiding down there i think for a couple of years before he and i went down together this was in 2012 i want to say when i went down so it's been a while now mm -hmm. um i really didn't put two and two together that the that when you see a big stag that someone kills, it's not a it's not a wild stag. It's no, a, it's a farmed stag. Whether it's in a high high fence enclosure or not, or had been raised on a on a farm and then released, whatever. There's all all kinds of variations there, and it was just all all the time I would look at New Zealand and man, man, I want to go kill one of those big stags. You know, I want to go go hunt one of those. It's just truly amazing. And then you realize, well, yeah, but that's an expensive hunt. It's a specific animal. It's not what you can expect when you do a, a public land, do-it-yourself type of an adventure. Right. You know? Yeah. And so I go down there and kill this nice five-by-six, you know, free-range stag. And I'm Beautiful. Thinking, yeah, I saw it. I'm <laughs> so pumped, man. I got this big, I got my big stag, you know, and other people are messaging me. They're like, why didn't you shoot a big stag? It's like, well... This but one didn't cost me ten grand either, you know. Yeah, so. that's where that's where the understanding of what it is. Yes, people go down there for for a large stag that are on estates. Um, you know, we we hunt our stags on six thousand acres, and that's a that can be a, a big chunk of property. That's a big chunk of property, and those stags can be pricks. There's some that we that have been out there for <laughs> two years that we can't find that are still there. You know, yeah. we see them occasionally, but. You know, people come in and do that part of the experience, but then they hunt the tar, which is high mountain, rugged, um, and and we're killing good old tar on you know in this in these areas that we have. But the thing is, is I go down there and and I'm guiding, and I we kill these you know big stags from three sixty to five hundred, right. you know, big beautiful. I have a day off and uh, got some information from my friend Fraser down there. And he sent me six, five, six miles back into the back country to go hunt some wild stag. And, and these things are, these things are wily. They're wily. And I don't know if you saw the picture. I think, what was it? Like a, it was a eight point yeah, stag. Yeah, beautiful. A beautiful stag. Yeah. Wild as can be. And I was so happy. And then I bring, I'm bringing him back and he looks like, you know, a yeah. dink compared to all these, but, but it was the experience of that. And it was a wild stag and, you know, being up there doing that solo by myself and experiencing that is the whole story. It wasn't about the size of the animal. It was just about that, ex that adventure and the experience. So people that go down there, you know, they, a lot of people don't want to spend a big chunk of money to go on a wild stag oh, yeah. st hunt because they're, you know, they're not going to get one of those big giant New Zealand, right. <laughs> New Zealand stags. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's so much about, um, maybe it's because we're getting older a little bit, but it, so much more of the hunt is, is more about just not the hunt, you know, not, not the, the kill or the harvest. And, and you hear that all the time or whatever, but it's, it's true. Like so much of it for me now is the, lo the location, you know, like, I'm even thinking about going to Alaska and guiding for my buddy, you know, just so I can film and, and hunt and be there. And um, nothing has ever worked out. So he messages me the other day. He's like, I got an idea. How about you come up in July and we'll do, he's like, I'm, gonna, I'm mapping out right now a hundred mile trip that will go through his hunting area that he hunts, which is all public land. He's like, let's do a hundred miles loop in July, scouting the country and everything filming it, doing whatever you want to do, have a grizzly tag in your pocket, and you're just coming up here and helping me scout my area. Oh, like, that's cool. I'm like, yeah, price is right. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's things like that that I get, I'm getting super stoked about. And a friend of mine just invited me on a backpacking trip to just go backpacking and fishing. And I'm thinking, yeah, I've got a hunt lined out, but 
maybe I can put off that hunt so that I can go do just that backpacking fishing trip. You yeah, know? and I think because so. because you've experienced so many hunts and so many, you know, kills and, um, you know, that has been a big part of your life that, yes, as you're getting older, you start seeing things just a little different. Well, you're going, yeah, I've done that, but I I want to go see that. And I, don't, do that. I don't necessarily need to kill something to soak it all in and just be, yeah, just enjoy I it. I think my wife's rubbing off on me. She, all these years we've been married, she's been wanting to travel and see the world and everything. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I, I have no interest in going to Europe. I have no, in fact, we went to Hawaii last year for the, after being married for, I don't know, 18 years, 17 years, however long. We went to Hawaii for the first time and I fought it and fought it and fought it. And then after going, I'm like, yeah, let's go back next year. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So she she might be wearing off on me a little bit to to want to to go and travel and see some other things that that you know that are just different. Yeah, just a different experience of life, living life. Because life's pretty short. If you really really sit back and think about it, my dad, our dadgum kids are they're teenagers, right? Yeah, my son is turning sixteen. My daughter's thirteen. They're independent, doing their you know hunters riding horses six days a week, and Gallon's doing his thing, and and uh, you know even through. Through the divorce, Denise and I, we get along really well and and balance the kids. And I'm yeah. gone for six months or whatever it is, just traveling and experiencing it. And I may not be making millions of dollars, but I tell you what, I'm one of the richest guys in the world when it comes to to living life and just and loving, you know, every moment of what I what I get to experience out there. Because you're right, life is meant to be lived. And if you're if you're too busy in the grind and you're not living. You're losing. <laughs> You're missing out. I hear you. That's another thing that drives Kelly nuts is I'm good. I'm not money motivated really. So it yeah. just drives her nuts. But then you got to realize it takes money to go do these things too. So It does It does take money to do those things. But And here's the thing. I run the wedding business and I guide. So I manage how many weddings I want to do and what time, what months I want to do it. Yeah. And then what months I want to guide and what months I want to hunt. And I just block them out for those for Damn. those for those times. Doing the wedding business, most of my weddings are on weekends yeah. during the summer. So if I do, you know, five to ten weddings at different locations on the weekend, I've got five days off to take the kids camping or to because nobody to gets married on a Tuesday. Oh, well, you have got one coming up that's on a Monday. <laughs> do you really? Yeah. I wondered today, you're all dressed up in your blacks. I wondered if you're either going to hit the golf course or go marry somebody. Dude, so. I was dressing up for you. I was excited. Really? I was excited Hot to damn. see you. Hot I was excited damn. to see you. Yeah. No, I had I had five weddings this weekend, and nice. you know, that was a good, solid weekend of just busting through. So Cool. Cool. Well, um, anything else you want to cover? We've hit about an hour or so. Anything else you want to cover on a podcast scenario? Because I'm looking forward to getting this headset off and just hanging out and go grab some lunch. No, it's been it's been catch great up. catching up to yeah. catching up with you. I know there's a lot more that we need to talk about that people are not going to be interested in, but yeah. um, we'll do it again too. I, I definitely want to do this again. Yeah, so. let's catch up after the guiding season and you know everything that goes on there, and we can kind of touch base on some of the things that we we just discussed about. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe there's some fresh new experiences that'll. Uh, you know that'll be fun to fun to share, but also let's go back on that, see what happens with the bear hunt. Yeah, you for know? sure. And um, you know, show some people maybe some clips of climbing in and pulling out the cubs and doing the research part of it. Uh, I think one of the best things that people can do to learn about the animals that you're going after, or to learn about you know the biology and you know what our states are doing, is just volunteer your time to to go on a sheep capture, or an antelope capture, or you know a roundup or you know, do whatever. Outside of Nevada, I don't know. But the Endow does a great job of letting people know when events are taking place and when they're happening. And there's, you know, another guzzler build. There was a fire, some fire damage up on the, um, oh, which, which forest was, I can't remember. But, like, they advertise that stuff on Facebook. It's on their website. Um, some of the other stuff, they might not advertise as much because they've got a certain list of volunteers that, that are first and they don't, they can't, they just can't physically handle that many people that would show up. But this one, I mean, they're talking about providing lunch and dinner and breakfast and it's a camping, you know, camp, bring your trailers, bring your families, camp out and then come help us restore these guzzlers, you know? And it's like how great of an opportunity, not only to do some service and some conservation out in the, out in the wild, but also the type of people that are going to be there are the type of people you want to interact with if Absolutely. you're trying to get into hunting. 
You yeah. Know, um, and even if you're in hunting, you, you know, you're learning a lot yeah. along the way. Yeah. So the other questions, there was a lot of questions because we're here in Nevada. There was a lot of wild horse questions. <laughs> I feel like I've covered that a lot in different conversations, and it's and uh, I didn't really want to get to that. So we won't we won't uh, we won't open up that can in this conversation. Oh yeah, I've got I've got some things to say about that. <laughs> We'll have to do that after a potty break. <laughs> uh, Tim, it's so good to see you. Thanks yeah, for coming up to Tahoe yeah. and, and hanging out with me. No, uh, you've had, I know you, you offered to come down to Reno, but, man, it was great to get out of town, get out of that rat race out here. It's beautiful. It's good to see you, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks again for all the continued support, and please be sure to email with your questions or comments about the show and hit that dang subscribe button and leave a five-star review of the podcast. As always, stay humble, stay safe, hunt happy, and get out and find your wild.